Thank you. Ambassador Brown. Just uh, real quick uh, on two things. One, I've this is an unbaked thought, and and um, Professor Sims is is very generous to to uh, assume that um, because he's not an expert in something, he shouldn't comment, and I, I won't I won't uh, give you that uh, that caveat. Um, but um, one of the things I've been thinking about lately, when I, uh, there was a lot of talk several years ago, really about the. Um, the fact that quarterly earnings reports for corporations was causing a change in the way that business leaders made decisions to the detriment of long-term strategy for corporations. And I think there's a similar, there's an analog to that in foreign policy. Um, and I think part of what you, the tension that we're raising when we say idealists or realists, we're really talking about timelines in some sense. And that's what I meant when I said, you know, the strategy is clear. It's, it's a disagreement over tactics. And my, my answer to you in terms of inside our own government, um, I think it's not fair to either camp. Either I, I certainly don't want to be um, painted as somebody who doesn't care about uh, the interests of my country or, you know, is... is uh, naive about the short term or whatever. Uh, I don't think my colleagues, who I dis who I find myself disagreeing with on tactical questions, are disregarding the long term strategy. Our president has laid out very clearly that that human rights is part of our national security strategy, and I think they're loyal to that to that vision. I think there are disagreements over tactics. I think that uh, the engagement with civil society is something that, uh, including public statements by civil society, always. Uh, forces a more uh, a more careful examination of the long term, and so I, I think that's incredibly useful. But I, I just think there's an analog there when you have structural incentives, which are very real, to measure things in will this go wrong in next week, one month, three months, it makes it very hard. You have to balance that with people who are saying, now think about 10 years. Um, and, and that's, I think, part of what you see play out in, in these discussions um, without commenting on the specific discussion that you raised. On the Human Rights Council point, uh, I, I think it's a really important one. And I would like to make a, um, a, a, a public plea, which is, I think one of the things that citizens of European countries could do is ask their governments not to trade votes for the Human Rights Council elections. Because we will never get a Human Rights Council membership that reflects Human Rights Council, uh, re reflects human rights leadership if all of the human rights leaders in the world have traded away their votes, including to those who don't represent human rights leadership. And the United States does not trade votes, and several other countries do not trade votes, but a lot of countries do. And it makes it impossible for them to then take a principled stand on these elections. It makes them impossible. It ma makes it impossible for them to encourage competitive elections. I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, the the, comp the last competitive election was when the United States and Ireland and Sweden and Germany and Greece were running together, which is, you know, that's a competitive election. But in other regions of the world, there isn't one, and and it, there won't be one until. There's a more uh, a way until there's a, a degree of shame attached to vote trading uh, because vote trading does not make it an election; it makes it a gangster's game. So um, that would be one practical su suggestion that uh, that European citizens could make to their to their governments. <laughs>